九月，一则金星上或存在生命迹象的科学新闻，引发了全社会的关注。一支由 Jean Graves 教授领衔的科学团队，在金星大气中首次探测到了磷化氢气体。这一发现表明，金星上可能存在未知的光化学或地球化学过程。甚至被认为是一种潜在的生命迹象。人类对地外生命的探索从未停止，而这次是否会给我们带来新的惊喜 ？Let's welcome Professor Jane Greaves. Hello, I'm Professor Jane Greaves at Cardiff University. So I teach students here astronomy, and I also do research, which is mainly in astrobiology, the search for life in the universe. So, which is something that's really fascinated me for a long time. Part of that fascination is now working on Venus. My regular work is on the formation of planets outside the solar system, but I got interested in conditions inside the solar system, and most recently, Venus. So Venus here is our nearest neighbor planet, but it's really hostile today, and so we've not done much in the search for life there. We've concentrated a lot on Mars, sending rovers that can look around and examine, and we've looked at the atmosphere of Mars for signs of any life that might be there today. But Venus, Venus sounds like a crazy place to look for life. So we've sent a few probes. Some of the Soviet Venera probes made it down to the surface, and NASA's Pioneer probe looked at the atmosphere. But the pictures that were sent back—I mean, it looked terrible. So it's a, it's a baked-out shell of a planet with very high atmospheric pressure, because the atmosphere is nearly all carbon dioxide these days, and that's just a greenhouse gas. That's pretty bad for life. But we think that in the past, Venus was probably a lot more hospitable. Because in the past, billions of years ago, the sun was a bit less luminous, and so it would have been cooler on the surface of Venus, with a capability to have oceans, for example, and maybe life could have emerged there. But then, as the sun slowly grew in brightness, things didn't get so good.、Uh, that increased sunlight started to drive off the oceans; they evaporated, and the water got split into hydrogen and oxygen atoms that could freely escape. So all that nice water escaped from the atmosphere, leaving a baked-out,、um, high-pressure surface the way we see today. And really, life couldn't survive there. I mean, the conditions were so hostile. We think even parts of the landers melted. Some of those heroic spacecraft got some signals back to us, like these photos we can look at. But they lasted only maybe an hour or so, and so it doesn't seem possible any organism could、um, be on the surface. It's just too hot. But as conditions at the surface got terrible, we think conditions in the clouds maybe got a bit better, and it's cooler and wetter up there. So I've got kind of a diagram of the clouds as they are today, and the atmosphere of Venus is much higher than that of the Earth. So the bit that's interesting is maybe 50 to 60 kilometers up, and we've been able to measure that conditions there are kind of nice. Temperatures up to 20 centigrade or so, and the pressure is a bit similar to the pressure at the surface of the Earth.、Um, in a sense, it's not hospitable at all. If you sent an astronaut to float around, they would find it terrible because it's 90% sulfuric acid there, and it's incredibly windy. They would just be knocked sideways at speeds of hundreds of kilometers per hour. But we do think it might be a habitat for tiny organisms riding along in the clouds, and that's why, for example, there are these plans for these future balloons that could lower a payload into the clouds and tell us a lot more with modern information and technology about what's going on there. But why this interest in the clouds? This is because Earth, for example, has a tiny, what's called aerial biosphere, microorganisms, single cells, maybe floating along in the clouds. And on Earth, probably those come back to ground to get nutrients or rest or have a life cycle part of it, which is on the ground, for example. And they couldn't do that on Venus. If they landed, they would just fry. But、um, we think that it's possible that similar microorganisms might be able to float along in the clouds of Venus and survive there. And actually, today, and so we're inter really interested in looking at that as a possible habitat. So, although this idea of an aerial biosphere on Venus has been around for, oh, I think since the 1960s, it's not been much explored, and the atmosphere of Venus, a lot of it's really opaque, so the light just doesn't get out for the interesting layers. But I'm by background a radio astronomer, and I was looking at it a bit differently because radio waves come through clouds and the atmosphere quite easily. 
So we knew that the middle atmosphere is quite opaque. It's a natural source of radio waves, but you'd just see a sort of blanket of radio waves, no interesting features. But I realized that if there are some molecules floating just above that layer in the upper clouds, they'd be able to absorb some of this radio light and there'd be a giveaway that those molecules are there. So I've got a picture here showing these molecules and we wanted to look for phosphine in particular, these molecules absorbing radio waves that come up from below. Those phosphine molecules would absorb at a very particular wavelength that we could fairly easily identify with radio telescopes. And what would be going on is these phosphine molecules, they have a quantum effect where they rotate but they could only absorb certain amounts of energy, so they make a kind of a jump, almost like a record on a record player going to a different speed. So they take in an amount of energy at a very specific wavelength to enable them to do that. And so we thought, let's look for phosphine. And why phosphine? Because phosphine is a signature of biospheres on the Earth. In fact, not aerial ones, but places like swamps. Phosphine is produced of a, as a byproduct of microorganisms that live in oxygen free conditions. And it's oxygen free conditions we have in the clouds of Venus. So I thought, well, this sounds like kind of a reasonably easy experiment to me with my background. Why don't we give this a try? Not really with a great expectation that we would find something, but I thought it's just a really nice thing to do with a telescope, just to explore this relatively little explored idea of an aerial biosphere. So I thought, let's use one of the radio telescopes I'm really familiar with. So what we've got in the picture here is the beautiful James Clark Maxwell telescope, which is on a high mountain in the island of Hawaii. Um, it's a real privilege to be able to go there and do astronomy. It's a sacred mountain to the Hawaiian people, and we really appreciate being able to work with them. And you can't really see the telescope there. You can see its shadow because it's lit from inside in this view. And it was wonderful to be able to work there for a while. I worked at this telescope, so I'm an expert in their instruments back in the 1990s, but it's been a very active telescope for decades now, doing all kinds of radio astronomy. And for me, it was perfect. I thought it has an instrument working at this very precise wavelength we need, which is about one millimeter, that could pick up the absorption from phosphine atoms if they're really there in the atmosphere of Jupiter. So that's what we went out to do. I wasn't really expecting to succeed. I thought it would be great just to participate in the search for life. We could look for this molecule and we probably won't see it, but we'll be able to say we can make some limit on the kind of amount of biosphere that could be on Venus. And a few other astrobiologists are going to be interested in that. And then I didn't actually get to do, and do these observations. It was a really short program. We didn't want to use up all the telescope time. So the staff there did it for us and they sent me the data and I looked at it and it was a bit of a mess. But then after a while I realized we really did have absorption from phosphine. That just blew me away. So we wanted to be really sure of this. So we then asked if we could use a more modern network of telescopes. That's the ALMA network of telescopes that's down in the country of Chile and the high mountains there. And we managed to get on sky with that as well. And we found we were right the first time with JCMT. There really is phosphine absorption. So we got to me these beautiful spectra. I guess to most people, this just looks like some kind of squiggly line and why would you care? But what we got is this dip at this wavelength in the middle that indicates some of the light, some of the radio waves are missing from Venus atmosphere because they've been taken out by these phosphine molecules. So if you do that in a computer model, you expect a kind of V-shaped dip at that precise wavelength, and that's what we saw. So there really was phosphine, and that, as we thought it could only be a biosignature gas, meant we thought there really might be some living organisms in the clouds of Venus. So we were really careful with this result um, because phosphine is a pretty simple molecule. It's PH3 is its chemical formula. So that's one phosphorus atom and three hydrogen atoms, like a little tripod holding up this phosphorus atom at the top. And we thought, well, a simple molecule like that, there must be loads of ways to make it. But the reason why it's a good biosignature is because if you don't have lots of hydrogen in Platinum's atmosphere, you don't get pH 3, so you don't get it naturally on Earth, and you wouldn't expect to get it similarly naturally in the clouds of Venus because there's not a lot of free hydrogen around. Um, and so it's going to be hard to make it there. And if you did have a molecule of phosphine, um, then it would react with other molecules really quickly or be broken up by sunlight. 
and it would just wouldn't last very long. So me and my colleagues, we ran thousands of calculations, and this was an effort across universities and countries to see if this could be some other source of phosphine. And we ran all these chemical models, taking into account everything we know about Venus, and we couldn't get past this, that where does the hydrogen come from barrier. It's just not, you just don't have the energy balance to make phosphine. So then we thought, well, there must be some other way. What, are, what naturally produces phosphine in a spontaneous sense? And there's one or two things that work on Earth. So possibly there's phosphine gas that comes out in the plumes of volcanoes. And um, it's not entirely sure, but it's a possible source of this simple gas. So we went back and we looked at other people's results to say, could there be lots and lots of volcanoes on Venus? And this is still kind of an open question because it's quite hard from orbit through these opaque clouds to take pictures of volcanoes and you're a bit reliant on radar mapping and things. So occasionally there has been something like a hotspot appeared in these radar maps of the surface and then it's gone again. And you can imagine maybe that was some kind of lava flow that cooled and disappeared. So Venus could be a bit volcanic but it can't be volcanic in the amounts of um, activity that we'd need. And in particular, there can't be water in these volcanic plumes like there is on the Earth, um, and that would be necessary as part of the phosphine chemical network. And on Earth, there's, there's lots of water around, but it's really dry on the surface of Venus, and so we wouldn't expect the phosphine to be coming out in these volcanic plumes, even if they're there. So we've kind of been driven back to the biological explanation. We know microorganisms on Earth can make phosphine, probably as some kind of waste product, but they just expel it. Um, now we're stuck with this idea of, is there a habitat they could survive in, in the clouds of Venus? As I said, it's something like 90% sulfuric acid. But maybe, just maybe, there's some way they could live in droplets. And that would be a mix of sulfuric acid and water as liquids, not as gases or solids. And that would maybe enable them to set up a tiny ecosystem, maybe just a few microbes in a drop. And they'd be carried around, they'd get some sunlight, they might eventually sink, and the liquids around them might evaporate. But they could go into some kind of spore phase and then be carried along and come up again. And like, so they could have a kind of life cycle in the clouds. And so that's the really open question at the moment. We've never tried to experiment with such a hostile environment on Earth, and organisms here have never had to adapt, deal with such a hostile environment. It just hasn't happened on Earth. But, you know, with millions of years in the history of Venus, perhaps um, Darwinian evolution just worked, and the things that were the most robust were able to steadily evolve and adapt to a lifestyle free-floating in the clouds. So that leaves us with this idea. We really do have an idea, although it does sound kind of crazy because of the hostility of Venus, that there's just possible there might be a biosphere there today. And so we're carrying on looking with our telescopes, doing other studies of this simple molecule, um, thinking more about its chemistry in labs we can do on Earth. And, you know, ultimately, we've got a lovely image here taken by the Japanese orbiting telescope Akatsuki, looking at some of the mystery changes in the upper clouds of Venus. We'd really like to do more of that work. We could send more rockets, we could lower those balloons, they could surf the clouds for long times, and we could really find out what's going on there. And I think that's the exciting challenge for the next few years.